everybody, it's Amy Warden with Great Cake Soap Works, and this video is dedicated to all things color for your cold process soap. And I'm talking specifically about those colorants that are more synthetic, like oxides, ultramarines, micas, and neons. So I want to show you the usage rates for each one of these, as well as some tips and tricks for making them work in your cold process soap. So let's get started. Let's start with the oxides and ultramarines. They are very stable in cold process soap, so what you see is what you get. You don't have to use a whole lot to get a really nice saturated color with these. In fact, I recommend using one quarter of a teaspoon per cup of soap. Now, I know a lot of suppliers may give you a per uh, pound of oils usage rate. I don't tend to create a soap that's just one color, so it's really difficult for me to figure out how much I'm going to need per pound of oils. I usually pull out like a cup of soap or two cups of soap to swirl back in or do some other design technique. So that's the usage rate that I like to use. So for oxides, ultramarines, one quarter teaspoon per cup of soap. And as you can see, there's a very limited number of colors that you can get with oxides and ultramarines. This is the yellow, and I don't even know if the supplier is around anymore. I picked this up from another soap maker a while back. This is the red oxide, which is really kind of a brick color. This is moss green, which is the chromium oxide green, and it makes a nice kind of forest green color. This is from the sage. This is ultramarine violet, and it will make a nice light purple color. I picked this up from Brambleberry. This is hydrated chromium oxide, and it makes a nice teal color. Again, from that supplier that I don't know if you can get it again, but these are available, all of these are available at the Sage, I know for sure, and probably from Brambleberry as well. This is brown oxide, which I don't use very often because if I want to make a brown colored soap, I generally just use cocoa powder. And then this is ultramarine blue, and finally black is another option, and this one is from the Sage. Now, one of the tricks for the purple, if you want a really nice dark purple, this isn't going to get it for you. You're gonna to wanna to combine just a tiny bit of the blue with the ultramarine purple to make a nice deep purple color. So there's one tip for that. Now let's move on. These are micas and they give you a very wide range of color choices as you can see here. Not all micas are stable in cold process soap, however, so if you will check my blog post in the link below, I'm going to show you the link to um, a list of micas that are stable and have been tested by other soap makers. These are all from the conservatory. There are other suppliers out there that have micas that are stable in cold process soap, and I'll probably provide some of those for you as well. Now, the downside to using micas is that you do have to use quite a bit to get a saturated color. So the usage rate for micas, top usage rate, is one teaspoon per cup of soap. So you can see it takes quite a bit more to get the color that you would get just from a quarter teaspoon of ultramarines or oxides. These are neons, and they're fairly new to the soap making supply list. I have neons here from three different suppliers. This is the Dayglow collection from the Sage, Majestic Mountain Sage, and they have a nice wide variety of neon colors. Now, how do you know when they're the neons? You can tell because the INCI is polyester. There's some polyester in all of these neons. The other supplier that I have is Brambleberry. They have a tangerine and electric bubble gum, and I know they have several others as well, and they give these nice, bright, vibrant colors. I also have a sample of some of the neons from Nature's Garden, 
and these come pre-mixed in glycerin. The usage rate for neons is actually half that of micas to get a good saturated color, which is pretty neat. So only half a teaspoon of neon colorant per cup of soap which I realize is difficult to measure if you've got a premixed color. So with these, you just kind of have to eyeball it and um, make it what you think looks the best. The cool thing about neons is you don't have to get a bright saturated color. You can make them even light and pastel and they give a really pretty color that way as well. So half a teaspoon if you want it super saturated in a cup of soap and less than that, like you can just work your way up till you like it. So that's neons. Next thing I want to talk about is how to pre-mix your colorant before you put it in the soap. Have you ever made a soap and it turned out something like this and you realize that the colorant did not get mixed in very well? This is ultramarine purple and ultramarines and oxides are notorious for clumping. You really have to pre-mix them before you put them in your soap. They will not disperse unless you do this. So what are the options for pre-mixing your colorants? Let me show you. First one, good old water. Second one, oil. And you can just use a pure plain oil or you could dip some oils out of your soap batch and use those. And finally, we have glycerin. So how do you know which one to use and when? Well, let's start with ultramarines and oxides. They will sometimes disperse in water and sometimes not. So the way you can test this is to just put a tiny bit in a dish, add some water and see what happens. Yeah, just kind of sits in the bottom here. Not really mixing. And here's the black. I'll try that too. And it mixes sort of, but really it's like you've got a whole bunch just sitting in the bottom there. So you know it's not gonna mix into your soap if you can't get it mixed into the water. So you might wanna use some oil with brown or black oxide. Now this can change depending on supplier, whether or not it's oil soluble or water soluble. So you just have to test yours to find out which one it is. Now the beauty of using glycerin is that it will mix with both water and oil soluble colorants. The downside to using glycerin is that you must stick blend it into the soap or it won't fully disperse. You'll have little pockets of colorant. Now let's see what it looks like when an oxide or ultramarine is water soluble. And this is a little bit of the hydrated chromium green. Just gonna put a tiny dab in there. And we'll add a little bit of water. And you can see you swirl that around and it mixes in. So that's what a water soluble oxide looks like. Okay, now let's say I want to mix a quarter of a teaspoon of my ultramarine purple with some oil and get it ready for a cup of soap that I'm going to be blending. I just add a little bit of oil to it not too much because if I add too much it's going to affect my recipe and give it a little more super fatting than I like. It takes quite a bit to get that ultramarine to incorporate with the oil if you're just stirring with a spoon. So what I ended up doing is getting this nice um, mini frother and I ordered that on Amazon and I'll give you a link to that. It's ten dollars but I think it's going to be well worth the ten dollars. I 
There we go. Yay. Now, if you don't have a mini frother, you can still get your ultramarines and oxides mixed into oil and have it completely smooth with a spoon or some other stirring mechanism. The key to doing that is time. The longer it sits in the oil, the better it's going to incorporate and get fully mixed into that oil. So one of the things that I have done in the past is to go ahead and add my ultramarine or oxide to the oil before I even prep the rest of my oils in lye solution. And just every time I walk past it, I'll give it a quick stir and try to incorporate it more and more. And so when I'm finally ready to make the soap, then it's nice and smooth. Okay, now let's talk about micas. This is a soap that I made just by adding the powdered mica straight to the soap batter. And a lot of people use this method, but obviously it can have some flaws as well. Sometimes it mixes in completely and sometimes not. So as you can see here, this time it really didn't. So my foolproof method is to always pre-mix my micas. And micas can be added to water or oil or glycerin. And for me, it doesn't even matter if it looks like the mica is incorporating into the water. I will still use water 100% of the time. Let me show you. Okay, this is a golden green mica. And just for demonstration's sake, I'm going to put half a teaspoon of the mica in my bowl and add some water. And I'm just going to stir with a spoon. And this one seems to disperse fairly well. There's still quite a bit on the top there. So I'm going to keep stirring. So that one incorporates pretty well. Not bad. And then the next one I'm going to do is this turquoise blue. And again, another full teaspoon. Now, this one is definitely resisting. It does not want to move into that water. It just sort of sits on top. So with a little persistence, I can get it moved into the water a little bit, and we'll call that good. Okay, next, let's look at neons. These are absolutely not water soluble. You have to use oil or glycerin. Let me show you. There's a little bit of the tangerine wow from Brambleberry. And here's some water. It is sitting on the top and on the bottom. There's absolutely no way that is mixing in at all. <laughs> Okay, let's try that again with some oil. I'm gonna do a whole quarter teaspoon, maybe a little more. And let's put this mini frother to work again. Sometimes it helps to stir it up a little bit by hand before you turn it on. That looks good. Let's talk about titanium dioxide. This is the ultimate whitening agent for your cold process soap. And you can get it water dispersible, which you can see it says right here it's water dispersible or you can get oil soluble. And I prefer the water because it mixes up so easily without clumping. And I even pre-mix it with a little bit of water in this container and then just dump in what I need. And the only downside 
to using the water dispersible is that you really do have to stick blend it into your soap in order for it to incorporate and not be clumpy. So there's other problems besides clumping with titanium dioxide and some of you may have experienced this before. It's called the titanium dioxide crackle and really the only reason for this is overheating. So I have done some experimenting with my recipe because this used to happen to me a lot more and realized that taking rice bran oil out of my recipe actually helped reduce the titanium dioxide crackling. Now there are certain fragrance oils that are going to heat up and cause more problems than others, but keep your usage rate as low as possible. Maximum one teaspoon per cup of soap. Definitely no more than that. In fact, if you use too much titanium dioxide, your soap is going to be brittle. And I know you can use it to offset some discoloring with certain fragrance oils, but if you've got a soap with a really high vanilla content and it's going to turn the soap dark brown, you really can't work against that. So just go with it or just use that fragrance in part of the soap and then you can color the other part of your soap. So that, that's my recommendations for titanium dioxide. Okay, one last colorant you need for your cold process color making arsenal is a true red. And I don't know how many people have said, how on earth do you make a truly red soap? And I'll tell you the secret. It is Red Lake Dye number 30. Now, this used to be more elusive before some of the soap suppliers started carrying it. One of them is Nature's Garden in their tomato red. This is exactly what you need, but it's pre-mixed in glycerin. And there are several soap suppliers that sell it pre-mixed. If you would like to get it in a powdered form, I purchase mine from TKB Trading. And then I can mix it with either oil or glycerin depending on what I want to accomplish with my design. So let's just mix a little bit of this with some oil. Now, usage rate for the Red Lake dye is the same as Micah's. If you want the true red color, which is what I have here, this is one teaspoon per cup of soap. So let's just add a full teaspoon here. With some oil. And this is another one that you'll have to mix up ahead of time or use the mini frother. Now, if you want a little bit darker red, you can mix it with a uh, red mica. And this is mixed with just a little bit of ruby red mica from the conservatory. And here's the comparison between the two. So this is just the straight red lake and this is the red lake mixed with ruby red. Mm -hmm.